Hi, my name is Lauren Ostermann. I work with Professor Helmut Ritsch at the University of Innsbruck in the Institute of Theoretical Physics. I'd like to talk about protected state enhanced quantum metrology, work that has emerged in our group together with Claudio Jenis and my thesis supervisor, Professor Ritsch. Now, protected state enhanced quantum metrology is deeply situated within the field of atomic clocks. Therefore, I will start with a short historical introduction and an overview of atomic clocks. I will then move on to present the Ramsey measurement procedure that sits at the heart of an atomic clock. I will tell you what happens if the atoms start talking to each other through their common coupling to the vacuum, namely by dipole-dipole interaction. And finally, I will introduce our work where we have leveraged this dipole-dipole interaction to yield a much better sensitivity in a Ramsey type measurement. And this is something we call the asymmetric Ramsey technique. Now, how does one come up with the idea to use an atom as a timekeeping device? Well, quantum physics tells us that the energies an electron can have within an atom are not only quantized, so only certain amounts of energy are possible, but they're also implicitly associated with frequencies, namely by this relation, E equals H nu, where E is the energy between two electronic levels, H is the Planck constant, and nu is the frequency. And since frequency is 1 over time, you have this implicit connection between energy and time. And thus, you can use the energy between two electronic levels in an atom as a time standard. You will then use monochromatic light, that is laser light, to measure out this transition frequency. And by counting the oscillations of the emerging light, by counting the oscillations of the emerging photons, you can thus count time. And obviously, and quite intuitively, the faster these oscillations are, the more precise you can count time. Now, it has always been at mankind's interest to count time, obviously. And I've compiled a list of how we've been able to do this over the last 3,000 years. So first of all, the least precise is just to look at the sun as it rises and it sets, so basically one day. And we have roughly 85,000 seconds in a day. So this amounts to a frequency of 10 to minus 5 hertz. Next, already a little bit more precise, is a pendulum clock, where of course the frequency is determined by the length of the pendulum. And you have about one second for the pendulum to take one full swing. And this amounts to a frequency of roughly one hertz. Something already a little bit more technologically involved is a quartz tuning fork. These are the devices or clock devices we have in our computers, in our laptops, in our wristwatches, in our mobile phones these days, where you, as I said, have a quartz tuning fork, an electromechanical oscillator, and you have some electronics to measure out the oscillations of this quartz crystal. And uh, what you end up with is a frequency of about 10 to 5 hertz, so 100,000 oscillations per second, 10 to 5 hertz. Already in the realm of atomic clocks, and obviously a little more technologically involved, is the cesium fountain clock, where you have a beam of cesium atoms, and you already use this Ramsey technique, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And this is what currently defines the Système International second, so what uh, defines our second, basically, as a physical unit. And these clocks are also the clocks we have in our GPS satellites. So this is what we use for military and civil navigation all around the globe, basically, these 24 satellites. And a giant leap forward already, as you can see, 10 to 15 hertz. So again, 100,000 times more accurate than the cesium fountain clock, which is already pretty accurate. Uh, are these modern day optical lattice atomic clocks, where you, for instance, use an optical tra uh, transition in euterbium or strontium. And this is uh, where actually my work now comes in. So as I said, nowadays we have these ultra cold optical lattice atomic clocks. And in these ultra cold optical lattice atomic clocks, you can trap and isolate the atoms for a very long time. That is, keep them trapped in the optical lattice and isolate them from their interaction with the environment. And with this, you're able to cancel out collisions, so the atoms are not going to collide with each other anymore, which would cause a shift of the frequency. And you can also eliminate all kinds of different other shifts by uh, designing your optical lattice in an intelligent way. And something that I personally find very impressive 
General relativity tells us that the closer you are to the gravitational center, the slower time goes. So this means basically that our feet live in a different time zone than our hair, just by a slight time difference, and these clocks are that good that they can measure this time difference at a height difference of one meter. And this time difference lives at the 18th decimal digit of a second. So 17 zeros and then this time difference after the comma digit basically. Right. So let me now talk about the Ramsey measurement technique that sits at the heart of an atomic clock. A tool that we use in quantum physics to visualize a system that consists of two basic states is called the Bloch sphere, where the north, uh, uh, south pole of the Bloch sphere represents the ground state, where there is no energy in the system, and the north pole represents the excited state, where there is the maximum amount of energy in the system. And with this, we are able to visualize all kinds of different superpositions between the ground and the excited state, and we are also able to visualize all kinds of different phases between these superpositions of the ground and the excited state. So, what the Ramsey measurement technique does for one atom is it starts, out, it starts out with the atom in the ground state. We then send in a quick laser pulse that is on resonance with our atomic transition frequency and create an exact superposition of ground and excited state. At this point, the atomic coherence is going to oscillate with its frequency and the laser is going to oscillate with its probably different frequency. And depending on how congruent these two frequencies are, if we send in a second quick pulse, we're able to lift our atomic state up to the fully excited state. And the less res uh, resonant the laser frequency is with the atom, the less we're able to lift our um, atomic state up to the fully excited state. So what this means is, the more we can reach the excited state, the better we have measured our frequency with our laser. And of course, for one single atom, this procedure is of course very noisy and the signal is also weak. So what you do is you use a, multi a multitude of atoms and thus you can drive down the um, noise with the number of the square root, with the square root of the number of the atoms you have in your ensemble. So if you have one million atoms, you can reduce the signal to noise by a factor of 1000. Right, so as I said, you have multiple atoms, and at this point, dipole-dipole interaction comes in. Dipole-dipole interaction emerges due to the coupling of the atoms to the vacuum field and to vacuum fluctuations. And there are basically two main processes that come into play. One is the coherent redistribution of energy, so all the energy that is in the system gets redistributed around amongst the atoms and stays in the system. And there's another process, a dissipative process, where there's energy lost from the system, and this can also happen in a collective manner. So, as we are theoretical physicists, we of course have formulas to describe this, and this is one main uh, equation we use, it's called the master equation. And here we basically describe the time evolution of, our, uh, of the state of our ensemble. And where this H is the Hamiltonian operator, this describes the energy that is in our system, and this curly L is the Liouvillian operator. This describes the loss of energy from our system. So our Hamiltonian in the system looks something like this, where well, I want you to note that there is a sum over i and j, and this omega ij, and this omega ij basically describes how the energy is distributed around in our system. And our Liouvillian also features a sum over i and j, and this means that not only can the excitation of the system be lost by spontaneous, um, by spontaneous emission through an individual atom, but it can also be lost by spontaneous emission that is a collective process. Right. And if you do uh, this full derivation and the entire math, you're going to be uh, coming up with coupling constants that as a function of the interatomic distance look something like this. And what I want you to note here is that the solid curve which describes the dissipative process, so the spontaneous emission from our ensemble, has positive and negative values. And in the region where it's positive, these are the blue regions, our new asymmetric Ramsey technique beats the old technique. And in the region where it's negative, which is marked in red here, the old standard Ramsey technique does better than this new improved 
um, asymmetric random technique. So what I want you to take away from this dipole-dipole interaction is that there are basically two processes, namely the coherent redistribution of energy, so the atoms talk to each other and redistribute the energy around, and there's also the possibility that energy is dissipated, is lost from the system, um, which can also happen in a collective manner. And at this point, the asymmetric Ramsey technique comes in. Now, as a goal that we set for ourselves when we started out with this asymmetric Ramsey technique is we wanted to basically increase the sensitivity in a Ramsey type experiment. This was our goal. And we wanted to do this by exploiting collective effects instead of trying to get rid of them what was done before. So this dipole-dipole interaction builds out different states. Some states which feature uh, an increased spontaneous emission rate so that decay very fast and some states which feature a decreased spontaneous emission rate which are very long-lived and decay very slowly. And this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to address slowly decaying states, so-called subradiant states, so that we could come up with a higher sensitivity in the presence of this dipole-dipole interaction by leveraging um, asymmetric or slowly decaying subradiant states. So let me explain that to you for two atoms. So as I said, some different states emerge. And as you can see, for two atoms, we have four basic states. There's the ground state, where there's no energy in the system. There's the excited state, where there's the maximum amount of energy in the system. And there's the symmetric state, which is a symmetric superposition of ground and excited state for both atoms. And there's the antisymmetric state, which is an antisymmetric superposition of ground and excited state for both atoms. And there are basically two decay channels. One that goes over the symmetric state, which has an increased spontaneous emission rate, and it's called a superradiant decay channel, and one which goes over the asymmetric state, which has a decreased spontaneous emission rate and is called a subradiant decay channel. And what we basically wanted to do is we wanted to use the asymmetric state instead of the symmetric state in our Ramsey technique to yield a higher sensitivity. And if you write the initial state that you're going to prepare with your first laser pass down, you have basically a superposition of ground and excited state for the first atom, and you have a superposition of ground and excited state for the second atom. And if you now rewrite this in the collective basis, you see that the symmetric state shows up in this mixture, mixture of states here. So we decided to put in an extra phase. We basically create a superposition of ground and excited state for the first atom, and we also create a superposition of ground and excited state for the second atom, but with an extra phase that manifests itself as this minus sign over here. And if we do this, instead of the symmetric state, we're going to populate the asymmetric state in our state mixture. So the regular Ramsey procedure populates the symmetric state, while our new, slightly modified Ramsey procedure, through this extra phase we put in, uses the asymmetric state. And what we were able to do is, we could come up with a sensitivity that is much, much lower than the sensitivity in the regular Ramsey type experiment. So we looked at the sensitivity for the um, collective sigma set operator, which basically is a measure of how many atoms we could flip up to the fully inverted state. And this is the figure the experimental physicists care about. And we could, uh, could come up with this diagram, where we basically see four curves. One that describes the minimum sensitivity for the symmetric Ramsey procedure, so in the presence of this dipole-dipole interaction. One that is the uh, black curve, which is there for reference and describes if, uh, what happens if you didn't have this dipole-dipole interaction, so just basically two atoms. One that is the blue curve, that describes the minimum sensitivity in um, by, uh, when we use the asymmetric state in our state mixture, so basically our modified Ramsey technique, and the dashed curve is again just there for reference, and this describes the minimum sensitivity if there is no decay in the system, which is a bit unrealistic in our scenario since we have spontaneous emission, but this is just there for reference, so if there is no decay, you can basically just wait infinitely long and get a perfect sensitivity. So, from top to bottom, the lower this number is, the better a sensitivity we get. And from left to right, there's time. So uh, the longer we wait, 
the worse our sensitivity gets because all these curves, except the one where there's no decay, go up again. And what we, we could do is basically compare the red curve to the blue curve. So we could drive down the sensitivity from this point up there to this point down here. So this means we not only have an improvement in sensitivity that drives the sensitivity down, but also by waiting longer, we could drive it down even further. And this is, if you wish, a two-axis improvement. So not only down, but also by waiting longer, we could move it down even further. And this is also what is my main message, what I want you to take away from this. Our work contributes to building a better atomic clock. Now, but of course, we didn't just stop there because two uh, atoms are nice and fine, but of course we have uh, went about and generalized, we, we went about and generalized this procedure for an arbitrary number of atoms. So what we do is we start out with all the atoms in the ground state. We then send in our quick laser pulse that creates the superposition of ground and excited state as in the regular Ramsey procedure. But here comes our extra step. The generalization of using the asymmetric state for an arbitrary number of atoms is spreading the phases out in the equatorial plane of the blosphere. And by this spreading mechanism, we actually shut the atoms up. We phase separate them to keep them quiet. At this point now, the free evolution kicks in, which we describe with our master equation. And here are all the, ter uh, all the terms that I described before, the omega ij, and the gamma ij, so the coherent redistribution of energy, and also the collective dissipation, which I've talked about before. And after this phase of free evolution, we might end up with uh, atomic states that look something like this, where there uh, has been some loss of energy in the system, um, and the phases of the atoms got uh, mixed and mingled around a little bit. At this point, we reverse our phase spread mechanism, so we send in ex the exact phases, but with a different sign, and we basically rebunch our atomic ensemble. And then we send in our second uh, quick laser pulse, that um, brings the atomic ensemble up to hopefully the fully inverted state. And this depends on uh, how congruent our laser frequency is with our atomic transition frequency. And thus, we can measure out, as I said in the beginning, the atomic transition frequency. With this, I'm already at the end, and I'd like to give you a quick summary. Now, we've seen that using slowly decaying, long-lived states can drastically improve the sensitivity in a Ramsey-type experiment. We've seen noticeable effects even with just a small number of atoms. So basically for two atoms, we've seen a tremendous effect. And upon implementation, this procedure, of course, will yield, to better, accurate, will yield better accuracies and lead to better accuracies in ultra-cold optical lattice atomic clocks. Now, finally, you might ask, why would you want a better atomic clock? Well, three th uh, things come to mind quite easily. One is fundamental physics. So this is, as I mentioned, tests of special relativity, tests of general relativity, high energy physics, particle physics, anything where time is of a crucial manner. Secondly, communication, where you would be able to achieve much higher bandwidths by being able to distinguish signals that follow each other much more closely than in our current communication technology. And finally, as I already had hinted at at the beginning, navigation. So if we put these clocks in our GPS satellites, we're able to literally find a needle in a high stack. So with this, I'm at the end. If you have some questions or comments, don't hesitate to drop me an email, laurin.ostermann at uibk.ac.at. I'd really love to hear from you. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge funding by the FWF, the Austrian Science Fund, and by DARPA. Thank you.